Ahoy, adventurers. It's your old buddy Hambone here with another promo code from our friends over at Noble Knight. This month, the promo code is Chill Out, and it's a nod to this episode's theme and the spooky weather. So as usual, this code will give you $5 off an order of $25 or more, either online or in store. And it's going to be running from October 13th through October 31st. So this is a great time to buy any of those spooky, scary games that you've been thinking about picking up at Noble Night Games. I highly recommend that you use the code CHILLOUT. This month over at Noble Night Games, get yourself $5 off an order of $25 or more running from October 13th through October the 31st. If it's spooky, if it's scary, and if it's a game you want to play with your friends, they've got it over at Noble Night Games. This is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com. He wanted to chill, but it's unseasonably warm for October. Stu Horvath. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> Why can't we have a fall, Hambone? Well, because apparently there's multiple seasons now, and we were in false fall oh. in September, and now it is summer once again in October. Uh, Not fair. Boo. I don't like it. False fall. Yeah. Ugh. I heard. I read about that on the internet. Yeah, it wasn't even false enough to wear a flannel. I know. Either way, we have a great show for everyone today. We are going to talk about chill. And a little later in the show, we've got a great interview with Nathan D. Poletta talking to us about Imp of the Perverse. Yeah, I've been waiting for that one for a while. I can't wait to chat with him. And apparently, he's got a pretty good chill story for us. Oh, yeah, that's right. But first, let's talk about chill. Chill. Hey, Hambun. Yeah, buddy. What do you call a person who runs a chill game? Oh, my God. What do you call person runs a chill game? <laughs> the chill master. Shut up. No, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. That's you, that's real. That's you're totally weird. jerking my chain. No, that's it, it. It's in the rules everywhere. CM, the oh, chill master. My God. <laughs> you know, we spent a lot of time on this show figuring out what alternate names for game masters are, <laughs> like the keeper of secrets, which yeah. is I would say almost as cool, if not cooler, than dungeon master. Yeah. This is the worst name <laughs> I've ever heard for a game master. Hey, John, what are you? Hey, I'm the chill master. Oh, God, it's just so mm, yeah. chill master. Like, I, you can't even, like... Mm. Like, if you thought, like, rolling up to a girl or a guy in a bar and being like, <laughs> hey, baby, I'm a dungeon master. Like, yeah, pretty bad. Hey, baby, I'm the keeper of secrets. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. All right, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm I'm now curious. Uh, hey, baby, I'm the chill master. It's like, oh yes, you definitely live in your mom's basement. Yeah, and yeah. you have not seen the sun in a while. Like, what the hell's going on? Wearing lots of polyester. And, uh, what the hell were they thinking? Naming <laughs> the game master the chill master. But in the scheme of things, I'm not sure that chill in general is the best name for a role playing game. Like, I get what they're going for because chill is like the chill down your spine. But also, chill is like, yeah, you know, I'm feeling pretty chill. Was chiller not available? Uh, I mean, it's 84, so I... Oh, wait, no, that's Thriller I'm thinking of. Yes. Right? It seems a little more on brand. Yeah. Maybe the Chiller Theater copyright made that muddy. Yeah, I guess I could see that. Yeah. So anyway... Yeah. Um. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Let's actually get into the game itself. <laughs> Chill is a horror role-playing game from 1984 by Pace Setter Games. Pace Setter is an interesting company because... When things were kind of going haywire at TSR, you know, Gygax comes back, Gygax gets booted out. There's a lot of tension in the staff and a lot of people leave. A lot of those people who left gathered together and formed another Wisconsin-based role-playing game company called Paysetter. And I just want to interject here. I see the logo for Paysetter and just the name of Paysetter. I feel like it's the name of a record label that would be putting out a band like Poco on 8-track <laughs> cassette. 
on Paysetter Records. Yeah, actually, it's a better name for a record label, I think, than a, right? than a role-playing game company. I digress. But I like the idea behind it. We're tired of this corporate TSR mess that we've been dealing with. We're going to go off. We're going to go on our own. We're going to make cool games by gamers for gamers like because we know what we want to play and what other people want to play. We're going to build something this summer. I love the idea. Yeah. And it didn't work at all. I think they have five or six games that they came out with. None of them stuck in my head except for Chill. And Chill doesn't last that long. It comes out in 84 and I'm pretty sure the line is kaput by 86. It was. And they actually did not put out a lot of titles in that time. No. No, it's like maybe 14 modules, the box set. There's a board game, which is interesting because it's written by what's his name from Dark Sun. Troy Denning, I believe, did the board game, which, okay. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's really all we got to say on that. Yeah. So Chill is a horror game. So this is the problem with Chill is that I love horror. I love the idea of having more horror games. But this is four years after Call of Cthulhu came out. And Call of Cthulhu really nails horror role-playing right out of the gate. And even though it is really deeply tied to Lovecraft and the Cthulhu mythos and all that, you could still do other kinds of horror games with it. And I feel like until Vampire comes out in the 90s, it's really hard to beat in terms of just like a system that simulates horror. Well, I think in a past episode, you really hit the nail on the head when you described the idea of horror as helplessness. Yeah. And for the most part, including things like Ravenloft, including things like even Vampire the Masquerade, there isn't so much agency of helplessness that goes on in, say, a Call of Cthulhu. Like To me, having played a lot of different games at this point, Call of Cthulhu is the closest, if not perfect, scenario for horror in role-playing games. For a long time, anyway. I think that there's stuff that's come out recently that challenges it, but for 30 years, certainly. Right, it was a standard bearer. Yeah. It was one of those firsts that happened to do it super well. And I think that Pace Setter made a mistake trying to reinvent the wheel, especially coming from a D&D background. The system is very complicated. It mirrors, in a lot of ways, Phase Rip from the Marvel Superheroes game, where there's <sighs> the chart where you have to compare everything to. And like, there's a lot of unfriendliness to it. Like, If you look through the rule book, there's a lot of multiplication and division signs in the text. And like, I don't want to see that. I don't want to do math. Like, my brain reels at it. Figure out a different way to do it, <laughs> because like, that's hard. For my brain. Yeah, the college dropout in me is so turned off right now. Yeah. And it winds up not really getting the helplessness thing. The idea is that you're a member of an organization called SAVE. You know what that means, Hambone? What it stands for? You know, according to Wikipedia, Ooh. it means Societus Argenti VA Eternus or the Eternal Society of the Silver Way. So actually, that's... Oh, this is weird. That is what they change it to in Chill 2nd Edition because it used to be... Instead of Argentus, it was Albi, which means white. So it was like, what's the whole name? The Eternal Society of the Silver Way? Yeah, so it was originally the Eternal Society of the White Way. And oh, that is were, wildly unfortunate, <laughs> even in the like, 80s. Ooh, yeah, maybe we should change that. <sighs> you know what they were going for, you know, but... Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a clear miss. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you're part of a larger organization, which means you have, like, support. And, like, there's, like, guys who have, like, careers hunting monsters. And all of it is built around this idea of 20th century horror movies. So sometimes it's really good and gothic. Sometimes it's really schlocky and silly. And there's, like, a confusion of aesthetic almost page by page in some of the supplements where it's just, like, I don't know if this is serious spooky stuff or if this is Scooby-Doo. I do like Scooby-Doo. I like Scooby-Doo, too. But it should be its own thing, complete Scooby-Doo, not, oh, we're going to do this really scary horror stuff, but then we're going to rip the mask off and it's old man Carruthers, and you yeah. know he's going to get me and my little dog, too. <laughs> I wish that Chill really embraced the Scooby-Doo-ness because that would have made it different. If they had embraced the hard side of horror, it would have made it more like Cthulhu, and I would be less interested. But this whole trying to do both at the same time really doesn't work. Yeah, there really shouldn't be half measures in R. Yeah. And I mean, like, you have the Elvira book. Yes. For those listening at home, I <laughs> love Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. I collect a lot of different things with Elvira on it. And one of the things that Stu gave to me one day, as it was like the coolest thing. He's like, oh, here, I think you'd like this. And it is a copy of Chill's Evenings of Terror, hosted by Elvira. <laughs> And and it's got Elvira on the cover. And every single illustration of the book, there's not a single illustration of the book. They're all, you know, studio photos of Elvira. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's all stock photos of Elvira. 
and it's set up. It's a whole bunch of mini adventures. And the conceit is that it's sort of like Elvira hosting the movie show. Right, which is all B movies. Yeah. And these scenarios actually kind of work better than any other first edition chill stuff for me. Like I think like that book is awesome. And I like if I wanted to run chill, I would run stuff out of that. Well, you have a, a wide range of stuff in this book. You have one about an epidemic, the Lanier House, one about a little room, Animal House, the house on the hill, still life. Rounded by sleep, crime magazine in the haunt thy native place. Like lots of different variations on B movie horror in yeah. here, and they're all short. I mean, the average one shot in here runs about like four or five pages. Yeah, they're one nighters. It's great. I feel like that was what they should have done. A lot of this stuff sort of has a hammer horror vibe, but again, like hammer horror was so across the board. You know, you have Captain Kronos, which is like campy. <laughs> and then you have, you know, Satanic Rites of Dracula, which isn't. But even when it isn't, it still is. Like the blood color in Hammer is camp. Right? Oh, yeah. It's a really hard thing to, you know, compare to, you know, a lot of people think that The Wicker Man is a Hammer movie, but it isn't because it's really deadly serious. Right. It just and, has Christopher Lee in it. Yeah. And it's spooky as all get out. And I don't think that you could do both in the same system. Yeah, I agree. But there's a lot of cool stuff about Chill. Like, I love the weird like fake leather, whatever texture that is on the front covers and the logo. And James Holloway does a great job doing the cover art in the box set. I never really warmed to him as a D&D &D artist, but he did Paranoia and Tales from the Floating Vagabond and Chill, which are all like human, real world centric kind of stuff. And right. I think that he just does that stuff so good. Oh, he absolutely, absolutely does. Like super realistic, but cartoony, you know? And it's a very fine line to walk, but he walks it so well. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned the faux leather covers <laughs> because it's the actual like photo of what would be actual leather, but printed on a cover. It's interesting when you think about what printing is after we talked to Daniel Fox on a previous episode with how much he actually put into to make a wonderful looking book with a soft touch cover and <laughs> yeah. like the beautiful bookmark in the middle of it. It's so crazy. Like when you look at something like this, it's like, yes, we know we can't actually print these in leather bound, but we're going to make it look really awkward by taking a photo of the leather bound that we were not printing on. You know, I'm looking at the box set. I don't think it's a photo. I think that they paid somebody to paint leather texture. That's even worse. It kind of is. Yeah, no, this is totally hand-drawn. This is somebody painting. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, dude, it's the 80s, so you know how many man hours had to go into making something like that versus now you just put a filter on your Instagram. It's like, boom, faux leather. Yeah, exactly. So chill's kind of weird. I really wish that the pace setter experiment had worked out better for them, but they never really got any traction. I think for these reasons, they were making a game that no one really asked for. Yeah, and that's always tough. Yeah. Because it's not something that's so groundbreaking that people are going to be running to the game stores or your Walden books to try to track it down. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Something like this, now knowing that we are in an... I will probably get a lot of flack for this on the internet, but it's kind of like a new golden age of RPGs and board games and all, you know, independently created games. If something like Chill came out now, what do you think the chances are that it would stand out amongst the flock? It wouldn't. And yeah. I know this because it didn't. So. <laughs> wow. Hot takes. <laughs> yeah. So a company of dubious merit when pace Hunter folded they bought the rights to chill then they subsequently sold them to another guy that guy brings it to mayfair games in the 90s and they tried to move it more in the hard edge of horror really good looking covers in that line really like taking off of the vertigo comic book vibe but again like the system was still too crunchy uh, it was a completely different system than the Pace Setter game, and it lasted maybe two years, three years. It was done by 93. One of the last things that they were trying to put out was Cyber Chill, you know, <laughs> and it's just like, oh, thank goodness they folded because <laughs> nobody wanted that. <sighs> and, you know, it's just it became a vampire, the masquerade, coattail chasing, you know. It's just so funny, like just the idea of that. I don't know how many people who are listening now have ever seen the movie The Net with Sandra Bullock. <laughs> Hopefully not that many. <laughs> well, I mean, it was probably big news at the time, but yeah. it was on a cable channel one night while I was staying in a hotel room, and I just didn't feel like turning it off. And I'm like, oh, what movie is this? And just kind of seeing how they interact. With, and we're not even talking about hackers here, which is a whole nother story. <laughs> but The Net with Sandra Bullock, I could just imagine that this is like the RPG version of a game that like, it just doesn't make 
any sense whatsoever anymore because now you just pull your phone out of your pocket and you have a supercomputer. Like the kind of computer that they use to launch the spaceship in the <laughs> 60s, this is more powerful tenfold. Like, yeah. Oh, God, cyber chill. Yeah, so, so and silly. Chill has come out a couple times since uh, there was a Kickstarter. I think that there was an aborted run at a third edition, and then there was a third edition, and it, I don't know if it's really done anything. It's like I don't hear about it. So, well, according to our friends over at Wikipedia, <laughs> JK, they're not really our friends. It's just the internet. They got Growing Door Games in 2014, went into a licensing agreement to reproduce it. And they produced a third edition of it. Okay. And it went so poorly, it lasted from 2016 to 2019. And then the people who started that have subsequently left the industry. Oh, jeez. Just choke up. We're done. No more tabletop for us. Yeah. Packing it up. Going back to being accountants. So the pace setter version of Chill, like I said, uh, the Mayfair version is a completely different system. So that pace setter system, I don't know if, if, if it's through pace setter now or a different company but there is a game called crypt world that came out in 2013 that uses those same rules so so chill does still exist in this form as well i mean it's fun it's cool like i like the vibe it's like a definitely a nostalgic vibe like i like the feeling of the original chill but like, you like the idea of it yeah i really wish it was a challenge to call it cthulhu because i think they could have pushed each other to be awesomer yeah i mean that's usually what happens someone else gets in the race and it causes you to run faster yeah Especially in horror. Yeah. Because you're being chased. <laughs> Literally by a guy with a <laughs> machete. I hate machetes. Anyway, it's really unfortunate that they just didn't nail this. You know, it's interesting, too, because most things, when it comes out with a newer edition of it, they find a way to revise the rules in a way that actually makes more sense yeah. and improves upon the format. But here... They just kind of went with the same old, same old. Yeah, I mean, this is a very 90s thing, too. Sky Realms of Jeroen had a similar thing where they had a very clunky, crunchy system in the mid-80s, and then Chessex picks it up in, like, 92 and re-releases it and kind of tries to streamline it and winds up breaking it more. And it just still wasn't a game. Oh, no. Yeah. You know, it just wasn't suited. You know, those crunchy games in the early 90s, you were getting more non-gamers in, brought in by, like, Shadowrun and... Vampire the Masquerade, they were looking to lower barrier to entry. And so a lot of companies that were, you know, Chessex and Mayfair, they didn't really have like an ear to the ground, you know, the way that White Wolf did. They didn't understand the market and they were just sort of cashing in. Well, that's usually how it goes, my friend. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts on chill? Yeah, I think that my final word on chill is just look at the posts I post on Instagram about it. Don't buy them. They're really not. I mean, you could get them cheap if you want. They're not good. Hey, man, I got my little viral one. That's all I need. Yeah, that one's great. That one's worth picking up. But like the actual modules, the box set is kind of cool, too. But like, I don't think that most people are going to find much play value in the chill products. They're sort of a historical oddity, mostly. Well, there you go. History, best left in the past. I guess being October, you know, financial failure is kind of scary, right? Like, is that, <laughs> does that fit in with the spooky October thing? No, it's a different kind of horrifying, especially for adults. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so that was our talk about chill. And now we're going to switch it over to talk to Nathan D. Pauletta about Imp of the Perverse. And worldwide wrestling. Here we go. Hey, Nathan, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, so before we get started on your stuff, I hear you've got a great chill story for Stu and I. I mean, I don't know how great it is. Um, <laughs> but Put you on the spot right away. Right. Yeah, when you told me the topic of the show was chill, uh, that immediately made me think of a kind of semi-formative experience, not playing it, but just seeing it. So I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, there was a little strip mall where I ended up actually working uh, for a little bit at a game store that was actually run by the guy who used to do uh, War Games West, the distributor, okay. if that rings a bell, which is another story. But anyway, next to the game store, there was a used bookstore. And I would go into the used bookstore, you know, get books and look for stuff and whatever. And they had a game section in there. They had like old Rift stuff and uh, World of Darkness. This is kind of like late 90s okay. era. And for the longest time, they had one copy of the like pace setter, chill, like the creepy face cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would pick it up and flip <laughs> through it and go, this looks cool, but 
I don't know if my players are going to be interested. And like, we were heavy into White Wolf stuff at the time. So we were playing tons of Vampire Masquerade and some like Mage, the Ascension and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, uh, we're, we have a hard enough time, like keeping those games going without me <laughs> introducing another game. So I'd flip through it, be like, uh, yeah, this looks cool. Uh, maybe I'll get it next time I put it back. And I probably did that 20 times. And never bought it. And now I regret it because I would love to have that in my game library just as an artifact. And like, because there's so much cool stuff just flipping through it. I don't remember the details. I just remember really liking it. And uh, yeah, so that is my brief chill story. There's the game that never was. I never... Uh, I feel like that's very similar to most people's chill experience. They saw it at the shop and they're just like, huh, that looks kind of cool, but I'm not going to buy it. And I think that's the problem with chill and why they did not survive as a company. Yeah. Hey, guys, I got great news for you, though. There's eBay. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Your chill dreams can come true mm. See, that's on the eBay. It's so attached to that idea of like, I should have gotten it at the time, you know, like <laughs> yeah. in the used bookstore with like the other random stuff, just this one book that now I would be like, oh, this was such a great get. Getting it now would be like cheating. Yeah. Now I can just go get on eBay. That's not fair. <laughs> hey, you know what? When you're right, you're right. So... <laughs> One of the things I'm really excited to talk to you about, I'm actually holding in my hand a copy of Worldwide Wrestling, the role-playing game. Now, I don't know if you know this about me, I am a huge professional wrestling fan. I picked that up from uh, getting into the show recently. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all I talk about, wrestling and Dungeons and Dragons. I'm actually really surprised that we've not gotten around to actually playing Worldwide Wrestling. Well, the only reason for that is because we are old and we have no time. Yeah, it is a hell of a one shot just to throw that out there. That's true. My comrades at Unwinnable actually have a game going that I don't have time for because I'm too busy, but that has been successfully going for a couple years now. Well, that's fantastic. I will tell you, dear listener, there is so much love that goes into this book. Now, if you are a fan of RPGs, it is a great RPG. If you love professional wrestling, there is oddly a lot of inside baseball going <laughs> on in this book. Particularly, one of my favorite things is the first essay on how wrestling works. It's like an idiot's guide to explaining wrestling to your friends. The essays actually are kind of stealth. One of my favorite things about the game, because when I'm, you know, running it and seeing people interact with it, I'm seeing how all these things are. It's kind of like seeing the Matrix, right? Like I'm seeing how all these things are linking together how role playing is wrestling and wrestling is role playing and they like both operate on all these similar principles. Yeah. But you don't need to know that to play cuz you're already playing a role playing game, right? Um so it's not like critical that you read that essay, but the idea is that uh here's a little explainer of like if you're coming to this without knowing wrestling, you already know how it works, I promise you. <laughs> Like, you don't need to learn a whole new genre just to play the game. I know that we want to move on to your forthcoming game, but I really have been dying to talk to you a little bit about how you came upon the idea of building a wrestling game out of the Apocalypse Engine with its move sets. Like, I think that it's just such a perfect marriage of two things, like mechanically and thematically, that just doesn't happen very often in role playing games where it's so perfect. I was wondering if you could kind of tell us the secret of how that came to be. <laughs> You kind of identified like why it is that it is so uh, because the move framework works so well for wrestling. The insight that led into being like, oh, I could do this for this game was just watching a ton of wrestling at the time because I had a period where I wasn't watching a lot and then I got back into it, et cetera. And it was around when I was playing in a game of Apocalypse World and I was watching wrestling and like, oh, all the things that happen on this wrestling show are moves like there are discrete repeatable genre signifiers that snowball into new exciting things there's only so many of them and you know we're not talking about wrestling moves like you know pile drivers and stuff and talking about cutting promos uh running into the ring performing feats of strength to impress the audience yeah like all of its moves it's pile drivers and the story beats I started with the pun, which was what if Apocalypse World moves were also wrestling moves, right? Because the pun-based wrestling is the best wrestling. <laughs> you know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was, a, it was a good marriage. And, you know, I saw that there was something there when I, when I was able to play it with people who weren't wrestling fans and they could have a good time. It's easy to pick up. And I will tell you, the amount of detail and love that you put into this book is really outstanding. Everything from the utilitarian inziguri fitting in any moveset <laughs> to 
what a jobber is. <laughs> you know, we should reprint that on the site or somewhere because we constantly get asked, what is Hambone talking about when he's saying <laughs> doing the job? I can't find it on Google. <laughs> and if I do, it's something dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it means what you think it yeah. means, man. <laughs> so that's fantastic. And I can't wait to sit down with my friends and really crack this book open. I actually am going to take it on a plane with me on a trip in the next couple of days and really just dig deep into it because it's also, in a lot of ways, a sales education book, especially about <laughs> cutting promos and entertaining a crowd. So with mm -hmm. that said, let's move on to the thing that you're actually here to talk about. <laughs> I'm glad that we started with Worldwide Wrestling because I feel like Imp of the Perverse couldn't be more different thematically and mechanically. And, and why don't you tell us about what Imp of the Perverse is to start? This game is a historical psychological horror game set in Jacksonian America. So it's the 1830s, 1840s, but in a version of it where the fictional elements documented by one Edgar Allan Poe are real in the world. So the characters you play, your protagonists, are those who have a imp of the perverse on your shoulder. Uh, you're someone who has some kind of perverse compulsion towards deeds that you know are wrong, and yet you derive some kind of pleasure or satisfaction from indulging in them. Naughty deeds. <laughs> Indeed. And you know, because you can see them in the world, that if you fully give in to those impulses, you will turn into a monster who embodies them. So you will leave humanity and become a literal creature in the world causing harm to others. Uh, in order to avoid that fate and to get rid of your perversity, you can fight those monsters, stop them, stop the harm that they are doing, and uh, perhaps in so doing, gain control of yourself and, and reject that aspect of your personality. In one way, it is an adventure monster hunting game because it is based around establishing, finding, and then challenging and defeating other monsters who are a preview of your fate if you you know don't walk this narrow line. And it is also a psychological horror game in the sense that it is designed to allow players to get into that headspace of a flawed person fighting to get better and you know, discover how that's going to go through play. And this is something that you kickstarted, correct? Yeah, so the Kickstarter was spring of 2018. And so as happens in the publishing game, uh, you know, there are some delays and whatnot, but the game has been complete for about a year and the print run is on the way. It's, you know, I'm waiting, awaiting a pallet uh, in order to break it up and start sending books to backers. So by the time this comes out, hopefully that should be in process. And you can pre-order this through ndpdesign.com, correct? Mm -hmm. And the PDF is available, you know, the PDF is out and available and that's, you know, matching the full game. So you can just buy that and then, you know, pre-order the book if you're interested. And uh, the book came out great. It's a graphic novel size, um, so it's a little bigger than... A lot of the small press games, uh, and it's a cloth wrap, gold foil print cover so that it can slide into your classics library without throwing anything off. Yes, uh, Oliver Twist, Moby Dick, and Imp of the Perverse. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's right there. But yeah, I'm super pleased with how it came out visually, and I have a hell of a time every time I get to play it. So Nice. It looks very much of the period, the book. I like that. Where did this spring from? Was it reading the Edgar Allan Poe story of the same name, or, or did it come from another kind of inception point? So this game has been a bit of a white whale game. I pulled up the original text file that I had notes for when I was doing the Kickstarter, and it was from 2009 or 2007, oh, something wow. like that. All right. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, the original concept was kind of an outgrowth of my interest in uh, 19th century horror in Edgar Allan Poe, just, you know, as an author, and in kind of exploring this combination of this game design corner of, like, what does a an episodic monster hunting game look like? That is equally about the character's journey as it is the, you know, the plot of taking down these monsters. So it, you know, went through lots of iterations over the years, and I would put it aside. Obviously, while I was working on worldwide wrestling, that was my focus. So I, you know, didn't look at it for a while, that kind of thing. But when I came back to focus on it, I had leveled up as a designer uh, and <laughs> was able to kind of capture the core mechanic is is one of temptation, where as a player you are tempted at points to do certain things uh, on a character level. And it's your choice to give into that or not. Um, you know the consequences, you know what's ahead of you. But in play, 
you know, a lot of the time people struggle with that choice. And that's the core experience that I was trying to capture. Because giving in to the imp gives you a bit more of an edge in what you're doing, right? Yeah, it gives you more kind of temporal like power in the moment, but it can be a sudden tipping point kind of thing. Like you need that boost to do the thing you want to do and it is going to tip you over or it can also contribute to a slow decline. And you can also reject it. One thing about how it's structured for characters is that the exits for your character are either giving in and turning into a monster or ridding yourself of the imp. The game is not concerned with like wounds and and health and you know physical death as a consequence because mm. that's not very interesting to me and that's also not particularly interesting in these stories that it's based out of like death is present but it's thematic it's not dramatic so you can fail quote unquote you can choose not to get the big boost and that is legitimate character choice doesn't mean you're gonna like not be able to be a bad guy or whatever and so that was key to, to have that choice be a real one for players now, when you either get rid of or give in to the imp, either way, your character is finished, right? Yeah, so it's designed for like episodic play with a possible slow movement of characters um, in and out. So the strict rules of the game are that if your character gives in to the imp and turns into a monster, that happens kind of after the events of your current arc of play, your, your current campaign. And then you are invited to become the the GM, the editor is what it's called. Uh, and you turn that creature into the subject of the hunt for the other players. Oh. So you, in that way, you do continue playing that character. Uh, you get like one more round with it, basically. But now you're on the other side of the screen, as it were, and you get to build them out and, and demonstrate to everyone else, this is what happens. Very interesting. I like that. That's a fun little twist. So the game is being fulfilled to Kickstarter backers now, and it will be available for purchase soon? Uh, yeah, basically as soon as the backer copies and pre-orders go out, then it you know is just up for sale. Um, though I will say, uh, depending on how the timing works out, the street price is going to be a little higher than the pre-order price, thanks Trade War with China. So That'll do it. If it happens that you hear this and go to the website and the pre-order is still up and you're interested, you'll save yourself a couple bucks if you get in on the pre-order. Well, that's awesome. I'm so excited to get a hold of it and dig into it and hopefully before Halloween. Yeah, definitely. So you can actually pre-order this right now from ndpdesign.com. You can order the physical or you can order the PDF. So definitely check it out. Yeah, depending on when you hear this, uh, either the pre-order or just being able to buy it will be up at my site. So that's ndpdesign.com. And we'll link to that in the notes. So Nathan, thank you so much for taking some time out and joining us on the Vintage RPG Podcast. Where can people find you on social media? I'm on Twitter at ND Paoletta. It's pronounced Paoletta, but I say the O so you can find the spelling. <laughs> also, same handle on Instagram, and all links to all my stuff are from the site, ndpdesign.com. I also have a Patreon for my ongoing design process, as well as uh, another project. If you're interested in the 70s television detective show, The Rockford Files, oh boy, are I we. do a podcast about that show with fellow game designer Epidiah Ravishal. What? And that is at 200 pod on Twitter or look up 200 a day on your favorite podcast catcher of choice. Oh my God. My mind is blown. I'm working my way through Magnum right now. So I feel like, nice. like we're cousins. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, and who doesn't love Jim Rockford? Am yeah. I right, guys? Oh, so good. Literally nobody. <laughs> He's the best. All right, Nathan. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, happy, happy Halloween. You too. Happy Halloween, my friend. All right, before we hit the go home on this show, I've got some great news for you. Nathan reached out to Stu and I and let us know that the books actually arrived pretty quickly, and now they're up for general sale. So he really didn't want any of our listeners who are interested to check it out and be disappointed. So he set up a special offer code for listeners of the Vintage RPG podcast. If you go to his website, ndpdesign.com to order Imp of the Perverse and put in the code VINTAGE at checkout. You can get Imp of the Perverse at the pre-order price of $28, which is going to save you $6 off of retail. So remember, if you go to order Imp of the Perverse, make sure that you use the code VINTAGE. 
Thanks again to Nathan D. Paletta for coming on and talking to us about Empath Perverse. He's so nice. I know. Right? Everybody we talk to is so nice. Uh, yeah, you know what? I don't often want to say that out loud because I, I don't want to jinx us, but I feel good about it. I feel like it's our our part of the country. We're just, you know, programmed to think that everybody's a jerk like us. Yeah, I know. And listen, folks, everything that you've heard about people from New Jersey is like 75% true. <laughs> All right, like 82% true. <laughs> Stu, where can people find you? People can find me on Instagram at Vintage RPG doing, you know, Vintage RPG things. You know, dice, old books, that kind of thing. Very cool. You can find me on Instagram at John Hambone McGuire, where I post pictures of my day-to-day adventures in podcasting and in life. You could also find me on the Twitter at Hambreaker. I tweet about Dungeons and Dragons. I tweet about professional wrestling. I tweet about cute animals. I love how consistent yours is and how, like, all over the map mine is. Yeah, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I had three years working on my other show, My Thai Happy Hour. It's pop culture for weirdos. You can find us wherever podcasts are found. So yeah, I got the rhythm down for all this stuff. I can't, yeah, like I can't even like derail you. It's great. Like I love it. Yeah, I'm also a salesman. Sometimes I black out and go to a really dark place, but man, I get that pitch across. <laughs> so for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 